uh, through the through the great tribulation, uh, God's purposes will be accomplished. His cause is going to be vindicated. His people, meaning the Jewish people, will be purified. His grace will be bestowed, and his son is going to ultimately be glorified. All of that is, is, is the reason that God is going to bring this tribulation that may be not too, too far in the distant future. As I look at the world scene and as I see things taking place over in Russia, uh, how that the, uh, the Russian bear, okay, uh, I don't know how much you men have studied um, the uh, four empires that are mentioned in the book of Daniel. Uh, of course, <clears throat> beginning with the Babylonian empire under Nebuchadnezzar. And it was in 588 BC uh, when Nebuchadnezzar actually went in to Jerusalem and captured and brought the Jewish people as captives. And at that time, uh, what we now know as the times of the Gentiles began. That was in 588 BC. So for almost uh, 2,600 years, we have been living in what is known as the times of the Gentiles. And so as we witness the turmoil throughout our world, and we see the ever increasing rise of ecumenism, uh, I don't know, you know, I, I was looking, uh, I received an article uh, from the Ukral Times, uh, the Ukral Times, and they were talking about, I think, the 42nd uh, anniversary of the Manipur uh, Baptist, which is the actually the Baptist convention uh, you have you have in Manipur, this Baptist convention. They're having their 42nd anniversary. I don't know how many of the Manipur Baptists realize how that uh, this convention is affiliated with the World Council of Churches. The Northeast India Baptist churches, uh, there's like 12, 10, 12,000 Baptist churches over in Northeast India, CBN, ECEI, is that what you call it? The churches, the Baptist churches of Northeast India. Uh, that organization has ties with the World Council of Churches. And this ecumenism is increasing. And as Baptists, we are to be separate from these types of organizations. We are not to be involved in this ecumenical movement because the, this ecumenical movement is what Satan is going to use to bring about the one world church, the church of Antichrist. And we as born again believers should not be part of this ecumenical world movement. We are to come out, Revelation 18, verses 1 through 4. Come out of her, my people, and be not partaker of her evil deeds. Uh, we cannot have fellowship with Roman Catholics. We love them. We pray for them. But as, as Baptists, as Bible believers, we are to be separated. And I have uh, talked to you about separation. 
uh, one of our Baptist distinctives, uh, and it might be good that I teach that course again. One of our Baptist distinctives, okay, B A P T I S T S. And I don't know, maybe all of you are not Baptists. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Baptist by conviction. I was brought up in a, I was brought up in a, uh, a country church. Our church was non-denominational. Uh, our affiliation, we had no denomination. It was a non-denominational country church. I was brought up in that. Uh, I didn't even know what a Baptist was until I met my wife. Uh, when I met Joanne in uh, 1966, 67, when I, uh, yeah, 1966, 1967, when I first met my wife, uh, she was attending an independent Baptist church. At that time, I was not a born again believer, but it was through my wife's testimony and through her faithfulness to uh, her local church that I finally became. Uh, born again, and I became uh, a born again believer. And the first, uh, I think I've told some of you, the first, uh, the first course of discipleship as a young believer in Christ in 1969, the first course that, that I went through uh, was written by Dr. L. Dwayne Brown, uh, who was a PhD. Uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Brown is still alive. The last I knew he was living in Florida. I don't know if he's still alive, but he wrote a little book, just a little tiny booklet. Uh, I think, uh, uh, Brother uh, Victor, I think you may have some copies of that booklet, A Biblical Basis for Baptists. Uh, I, I have these available. These are available over have, through uh, uh, in Assam. Uh, we have copies of this little book, English, English copies. There's also a Manapuri translation of this book, a biblical basis for Baptists. But I did that study in 1969 as a new believer. I was born again December 14th, 1968. And uh, the, the requirement of our local church in order to become a member of that church, that they, uh, I don't know if I had to do this course to become a member, but one of the requirements for uh, their new, you know, as new believers was to do this uh, course. It had just been written, 1969 is when the book was released. So I was one of the first people probably to take this discipleship course a biblical basis for Baptist, but it laid such a profound foundation for me as a new believer. It gave me a good understanding of what is a Baptist, because I had no idea, and so I did this little study, B, biblical authority, A, autonomy of the local church, P, priesthood of believers, T, two ordinances, I, individual soul liberty, S, saved church membership, T, two ordinances, baptism in the Lord's table, and then the last, uh, the last S, separation. And I was taught uh, that we are to be separated. We are to be holy. God expects his people, his children to be holy, and there's, we are to live separated lives, uh, you know, and, and that we are to come out from among them. We're not to love the world. We're not to be part of the world. We're, we're in the world, we're not, but we're not to be part of the world. And so I was taught that we, we were to have personal separation. I was taught that we were to have uh, uh, ecclesiastical separation, that we could not be aligned with churches that don't teach the Bible. If, te if they don't teach, you got to be born again. If they teach uh, uh, salvation by baptism or something like that, we can't. We can't have fellowship with people that don't believe the Bible, that don't believe the, the, the basic fundamentals of the Word of God. How can we have fellowship with people? And so as a uh, as Baptists, we believe in separation personally, we believe in separation ecclesiastically, and we believe in separation 
governmentally. Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render unto God the things that are God's, okay? There has to be this separation between the church and the state. The state can't be dictating to our churches and telling us how to run our congregations, nor uh, does the church, uh, should we be telling the government how to do their job, okay? There's this, this separation. However, politically, as believers, we have to be involved. We can't just let our government uh, run without our involvement. Uh, we must be involved politically. And I praise God that in America, uh, we just had a, a, an election in Ohio and a fine young man got elected, a Republican. And I think that in America, there is a movement taking place. Praise God. God must be giving us uh, a second reprieve, uh, our Supreme Court. You, you, I don't know if you've heard this in India yet, but yesterday, uh, it was released that our Supreme Court is getting ready to hand down a, a directive from the Supreme Court of the, of the United States of America, nine justices, that they are saying that they're going to overturn Roe versus Wade. Uh, Roe versus Wade is what opened the floodgates of abortion in America over 40 years ago. And for the past 40 plus years, we have murdered 65 million babies, nearly, nearly 65, it's almost 64 million that they, that they have recorded 64 million abortions in America. How many D.L. Moody's? How many, how many, uh, uh, Adoniram Judson's. How many uh, of these godly men and women have been aborted over these past 40 plus years that could have been future evangelists, that could have been future missionaries through this wicked process of abortion? I thank God that our Supreme Court is getting ready to overturn this wrong law that dictates that it should be federally mandated in America, it's unconstitutional. And I thank God that our, our justices are realizing that and that they're getting ready to overturn Roe versus Wade. May God do it, may they do it, to, to remove God's judgment that is upon us because of this wickedness. And so uh, it, it's, it, you know, so we can't, uh, we can't just divorce ourselves. Uh, these justices, these nine justices, uh, some of them are Roman Catholics. Some of them are Christians, uh, Bible believers. Some of them are, are probably atheists or, or agnostics. But I thank God that they have enough sense to realize that, that we should not be killing our offspring. You know, it's amazing. I saw, I see articles about how uh, they're so concerned about uh, elephants or horses or dogs or cats, but yet we're killing babies. It just makes no sense to me. And so uh, this one world church movement is going to be established. And uh, the leader known as the Antichrist is going to establish his reign, but it's only going to be temporary. While it is fascinating and even frightening to consider how the one world philosophy of our government is growing in compatibility with the end times picture, let us not become enamored or infatuated with how this world is progressing toward its own end and ultimate demise. The tribulation period is not about the accomplishments of the one world church or the kingdom of the Antichrist. Both of them will enjoy a very short rise and an utterly complete 
destruction. The Antichrist will reign in the second half of the tribulation, but it's not going to be his day. It is the day of Jacob's trouble. The Bible calls the latter part of the tribulation the day of Jacob's trouble. Why? Because the tribulation is a time when God is going to be specifically dealing with Israel. Right now, we are in the times of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles, as I previously said, began in 588 BC when Nebuchadnezzar went into Jerusalem. And you remember, he took captives. Daniel, Daniel was one of those captives. Uh, probably his mother and father, they may have been killed by Nebuchadnezzar's army. And Daniel may have been orphaned. And he was brought back as a captive by Nebuchadnezzar. And you remember Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, okay? These four Hebrew children that actually became future leaders in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, okay? In that Persian empire. Daniel and his three friends, they became uh, high influential leaders. And so we as believers, we must be involved in our, our government. It's very important that we become involved in our government. Now, uh, it is, as I said, it is, uh, it is a time in which God's purposes will be accomplished, this tribulation. His cause will be vindicated. His people will be purified. His grace will be bestowed, and his son will ultimately be glorified. While history often extols the accomplishments of men, History has not been told until it identifies the purposes of God accomplished therein. You know, we look at our world right now and we say, wow, uh, how can Putin do what he's doing? How can this man get away with all of this murder? I mean, uh, I don't know. I guess you probably heard they uncovered one grave over there. Uh, in, in Ukraine, they uncovered one grave, 9,000 bodies in one mass grave, 9,000. How many, of, how many more of those graves will they uncover in Ukraine? Uh, this is unbelievable. It's hard to believe that such brutality can occur in our, in our age right now. Uh, all the knowledge, all the technology we have, how can people be so, so brutal, you know? And, and it's, not, it's, not, it's not ending yet. I, I read something that, uh, that Putin, uh, he does not plan to stop uh, with Ukraine. Uh, I, I've, I read something, I saw something where, where he plans to go beyond that. And as I said uh, some weeks ago, this could be a precursor of Ezekiel chapter 38. And if that is the case, fellas, you better read Luke 21, 28. You better read Luke 21, 28. Luke 21, 28 says, when you see these things begin to come to pass, what things? The things that Jesus told us about in Luke chapter 21, in Matthew chapter 24, in Mark chapter 13, the things that Jesus told us are going to happen in those three chapters. Those three men, they almost said the same thing, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of them almost verbatim said exactly, re re repeated the words of Christ as he sat on the Mount of Olives and he gave that dissertation of what it was going to happen, what would be the sign of his coming and of the end of the world. And he gave us an itemized list of things that would occur. And we are now seeing those things begin to come to pass. And Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, you lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. 
And I believe that's a reference of the rapture. Uh, the rapture is going to take place. And so as we study these end time events, we're confronted with the simple but profound nature of God's sovereignty over his creation. You know, whoever thought, I, I, you know, I never thought Putin was capable of doing what he's been doing. I never dreamed that he would have such capability. You know, I've seen, you know, maybe you've seen some of the pictures uh, online or in the newspaper of him with, uh, you know, his uh, khakis on and uh, nothing on top. And he's there, you know, holding his uh, muscles. And he, I don't know, did any of you ever see a picture of Putin uh, where his uh, top is topless? I mean, he's there flexing his muscles, you know? I mean, this man, he has an ego. He has an ego, a very huge ego. Uh, but he's also KJB, former KJB. And uh, even though he hides behind the Greek or the Russian Orthodox Church, obviously he himself is an atheist or at least an agnostic to do what he's doing. How could anybody uh, commit the crimes that he just go into a sovereign nation and, and do what he's doing? But uh, we do not serve a God whose purposes can fail. We do not serve a God whose plan can be overcome by the powers of darkness. We do not serve a God who is subject to the whims of his creation. We serve a God who accomplishes all of his pleasure. And when you read Ezekiel chapter 38, it's very clear that there is going to be a northern coalition of nations, okay? And uh, according to the Bible, it's believed that it's going to be this revived Roman Empire, okay, that is going to form a coalition comprised of Russia, Turkey, Iran, Syria, Libya, and even Germany is supposed to, according uh, to be, according to the Bible, according to Ezekiel 38, even Germany is going to be part of this coalition. Now, right now, all of those nations I've mentioned are aligned with Russia, except Germany. And we know where Germany, that they were the ones that were the perpetrators that tried to exterminate the Jewish people uh, during World War II, six million in gas chambers. And so uh, that mentality obviously is still there and probably alive and well in that nation of Germany, even though maybe right now they're not taking the side of Russia. According to the Bible, they will, okay? And so Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10, I'm going to bring up a slide here let me let me bring this up let me share my screen i want to uh um view this let me see here i don't know am i able to do this uh hmm is anything is hard sir am i am, am i sharing my screen i'm not sharing not display are you sharing? No, no, I'm not saying anything, but are we doing that? Okay, okay, there we go, there we go. Okay. Okay, so let me, uh, let me share. Right, uh, you, you remember, you remember that uh, we talked about eschatology, that's what we're talking about, eschatology. Uh, what is eschatology? And I gave you this definition as a branch of theology concerned with the final events in the history of the world or in humankind. It defined, it's a belief concerning death, the end of the world, or the ultimate destiny of humankind, specifically any of various Christian doctrines concerning the second coming, 
the resurrection of the dead or the last judgment. And that definition comes from Webster's Dictionary. Now, I, I, don't know, I don't know how to do this. I think I need to stop the share just a second. Let me, let, me go, let me go out of here and let me see if I can correct. For some reason, I'm not, I'm not able, just bear with me just for a minute, folks. I'm sorry. Uh, I am trying to bring up a slide. And some reason my computer is not not cooperating, so I'm reopening, I'm reopening the file. Okay, so please bear with me. I want to get to the uh, to the slide that I want to begin with. Okay, let me uh, let me see if we can do this now. Okay, am I sharing? No, sir. Okay, let me. Uh, Okay, why am I not? Are you still there? Yes, sir. Trying to bring you up. Oh, there you are. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Okay, all right. Now, bear with me here. Okay, share screen. Okay, now <clears throat> I'm going to share. Am I sharing? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Okay, well, I'm not seeing it. Uh, that is all your file, sir. Your uh, computers, uh, that is all your file is sharing. Not oh, okay, very good. Now, okay. do I have fundamental distinctions, okay? Is that what you're seeing? Yes, 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 sir, we can see you. Uh, we can share, uh, we can see your screen. Uh, fundamental distinctions between covenant theology and dispensation, right? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, Doctor. Uh, there's a. Uh, did did all of you receive a copy of his paper? Yes. Brother Victor, did you pass this on to all of our our uh, students? Yes, right, right. We all received okay. through WhatsApp, right? Yes. Okay. I sent, I sent you a copy of this paper, okay? And then I gave you a link, okay? This, do you see this link right here? If, uh, if, I don't know how to, I don't know how to, I don't know how to get into that link. But if you go to that link that's on your screen right now, if you can, I don't know, is there some way you can get into that link? Yeah. If you go to that link, you can read his paper. So we're talking about the coming period of tribulation. This is the verse that I wanted to, to bring up. Isaiah 46, verses 9 through 10. God said, remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from the ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So we serve a God who accomplishes all of his pleasure. And so in this lesson that we're talking about today, 
we're going to focus on the tribulation period uh, and move from the description that uh, John talked about last week to what is the purpose? What is the purpose of the tribulation? The first purpose of the tribulation it is, it is a, it's described as a tribulation, okay? In Matthew 24 and verse 21, and I hope you'll write these verses down. I'm not going to put them up on, on my screen, okay? But in, in Matthew 24, verse 21, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. In Matthew 24, 29, <clears throat> now that verse 21, Matthew 24, 21, this is actually more, the tribulation begins with the rapture. At least that's my understanding. Would someone look up, uh, last week we looked up 1 Thessalonians, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians. Last week we looked at 2 Thessalonians, I remember John, John had you look at 2 Thessalonians, okay? I want us to look there again in chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians. Let's look at verse 10 of the first chapter. To wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. What is he talking about? The wrath to come. Okay. I believe that definitely this is talking about judgment in hell but i think it it's also it could have a reference to something more than that uh look over to second thessalonians uh, chapter five look at second thessalonians chapter five and look at verse nine for god hath not appointed us to what to ruts to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have not been appointed to wrath, okay? What is the tribulation period? What is the tribulation period? It is a time of God's wrath. Seven years of God's wrath being poured out upon, upon is acting up. It's already starting to heat up. Okay, brothers, I'm back. I'm, I'm back, and I'm not going to be able to share my screen, okay? Are you still there? We, is everyone still there? Yes, sir, we're here. Okay, all right. Thank you. Uh, my computer overheated again. 
and I lost you. I'm sorry. I need uh, Victor. I think uh, something you guys can pray for is uh, Brother Jim needs a needs a new computer. <laughs> uh, I, I need to get another computer. Okay, Second Thessalonians chapter two and verse one. Okay, we looked at verse ten that God has delivered us from the wrath to come. First, uh, Second Thessalonians one verse ten. Now we move to chapter 2, verse 1. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain. Verse 2. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak. The right chapter. First Thessalonians 5 9, for God has not appointed us to wrath. Now, Second Thessalonians chapter, <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 1. <clears throat> I get in the right book. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. What is that talking about? What is our gathering together onto him? What is he talking about here? Anybody want to inject? Maybe the rapture, sir. Exactly. Exactly. Because in the first chapter, in the first book of Thessalonians, in chapter four, Paul told them about the rapture. Okay. In that first chapter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. He talks to them about the rapture. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 4. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 4. Paul says, but you, brethren, are not in darkness. Okay? That that day should overtake you as a thief. Who's he talking here? He's talking to the Christians, to the believers in Thessalonica. And he says to them, the day of the Lord, verse two, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. I'm in first Thessalonians chapter five, verse three, for then they shall say peace and safety. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Okay? This is talking about the world, the unbelievers. But he says in verse 4, but you, brethren, you, you who are believers, are not in darkness, and that day should not overtake you as a thief, okay? When the day of the Lord, when the tribulation comes, it's going to come uh, with unbelievable suddenness, and, and it's going to, and, and, and the tribulation, when it begins, it's going to begin with a dis destruction, but he says that day should not overtake us, okay? Why? Because we have the, the scriptures. We have the Bible, okay? And he says then in verse 9, God's not appointed us unto wrath, okay? And so this time of tribulation is a time of God's wrath and God's judgment upon the world. And so something's going to happen before uh, this day of wrath comes, and that's what he's talking about in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. He says, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, verse 2, that you be not so soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither in spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, 
as that the day of Christ is at hand. He said, apparently there was a letter that had been circulated among the churches 2000 years ago that was telling the people that the rapture had already occurred, that Jesus had already come back and that they, were, they, they had missed. And Paul says, no, 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 no. And then he tells them, here's what's going to happen. Verse three, let no man deceive you by any means. Verse 2 Thessalonians chapter two, verse three, for that day, what day? The day of the Lord. When does the day of the Lord begin? When God begins again, when the times of the Gentiles ends, and God now begins to deal exclusively with the nation of Israel. This 70th week of Daniel, this seven year period known as the time of Jacob's trouble, known as the day of God's wrath. Okay. He says, Don't let any man deceive you, for that day shall not come. Verse 3, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, except there come a falling away first. What does this mean? A falling away. Can I ask you, brethren, do you think that we have seen any kind of a falling away? Has there been uh, an apostasy? Because that's what the word is, apostasia. In the Greek, a falling away, the Greek is apostasia, apostasy. Uh, do you think that we have seen any kind of major apostasy taking place in our churches? Any of you feel that there has been, or, or am I just uh, imagining something? Talk to me. Has there been? Yeah, there are wrong, wrong, wrong teachings we find. Huh? Wrong teachings. Wrong yeah. teachings, false teachings. Exactly. Are we seeing a huge increase of this? And, and, and according to what Paul is saying, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. Uh, in in uh, Timothy, Paul said, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, okay? And so Paul says there's going to be a falling away, this apostasia where men, you know, they will, uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, look at it, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 3, 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Otherwise, uh, they don't want to hear sound doctrine, but they want people to tell them what they want to hear. Okay, and they will heap to themselves teachers that will tell them what they want to hear. Verse four, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and they shall be turned onto fables. A fable is a falsehood, falsehoods, okay? So I don't know if you feel that what we're seeing in our lifetime, what, what I've experienced, okay? When I was a little boy growing up, I remember sitting in the church and uh, our pastor would preach on the uh, second coming. He would preach on the rapture. And I would get very uncomfortable because I wasn't sure and I wasn't ready, okay? And so in 2 Thessalonians 2, okay, he says there's going to be this falling away. 
and then what does he say? That man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. Okay, and who is this? Who is this man of sin? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, that's called the son of perdition. Who is this man? The Antichrist. It's the, it's the man that's described in Revelation, okay? This man of sin. And he, it says in verse four, he's, and, and this is actually exactly what Daniel said, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshiped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, okay? Now, this temple, literally, it, it, that Paul's talking about here, could be our body. Our body is referred to as the temple of God, okay? Where humanism, humanism will actually uh, reach a, such an epitome where humanism is being taught. But I'll, I think also what this is referring to is the literal temple in Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt. Now that has not happened yet, okay? But in order for the abomination of desolation to occur, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, and also in Matthew 24, verse 15, in order for that to occur, the temple in Jerusalem has to be rebuilt. And apparently, uh, this, this man of sin, this antichrist, this false Christ, apparently the Jews are going to acknowledge him. The Jewish nation is going to acknowledge him as their Messiah. And they're going to receive him. And in the middle of the tribulation is when he's going to actually betray the covenant that he makes with them. Uh, he's going to have an agreement, some kind of a treaty, maybe a peace treaty, okay? And so what we see now taking place in, in Russia, okay, this movement into Ukraine, and, and it could even accentuate and go beyond that, okay? So Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, lift up your eyes because your redemption is drawing nigh. So man, I believe that the coming of the Lord is very near. Look at verse five. Remember you not, Paul says, that when I was with you, I told you these things. Verse six, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Verse seven, for the mystery of iniquity does already work. 2,000 years ago, this mystery of iniquity has, was at work. It's been at work for 2,000 years. But Paul says, only he <coughs> who letteth will let. Who is this? I believe this is God. Only God will permit this iniquity to continue uh, until he be taken out of the way. And of course, uh, I believe this is a direct reference to the Holy Spirit. Right now, the Holy Spirit is, lives in us, lives within us. And once the, once the church is raptured, once the church is removed, then, verse 7, uh, verse 8, then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the uh, spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming even whose coming is after the work of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And so 
in order for the tribulation to occur, we believe that the rapture has to first occur. Verse Matthew 24, 21, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since, since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. This is when God is getting ready to make his new heaven and new earth. Actually, immediately after the tribulation, when God is getting ready to bring in his kingdom, he's going to actually bring in his thousand year millennial reign. Revelation 7, 14. And I said unto him, sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Okay. These people. So there's going to be a large group of people that are going to get saved, both Jews and Gentiles, during the tribulation period. Throughout the New Testament, the term tribulation means trouble, persecution, affliction. In our study of eschatology, tribulation refers to a, per a future period when God will pour out his righteous judgments on the earth. The coming period of tribulation will be unlike any other period that has ever occurred on the face of the earth. The intensity of the spiritual warfare in which believers live will be readily apparent to all who believe during the tribulation period. In order during that tribulation, people are going to be beheaded. Okay. This period, secondly, is described as an hour of testing. Look at Revelation 3 and verse 10. Revelation 3 and verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Revelation 3.10. I believe that this hour of temptation mentioned here is the tribulation. The seven year tribulation period. The church age believer has the promise of God to be kept from this hour of testing, which will come to try them that dwell upon the earth. The book of Revelation, um, constantly you, you read that phrase, them that dwell upon the earth. Earth dwellers. Earth dwellers. These are people that are totally worldly minded. They have no consciousness of God, no desire to serve God, we are not that way. We as believers are not to be earth dwellers. We are not to be worldly minded. First John chapter two, someone read first John two verses 15 through 16. First John two, 15 through 16. Someone turn your mic on and read. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of Father is not in him. Verse 16. For everything in the world, the craving of sinful man, the loss of the eyes, and the posting of what he has and done, come not from the Father, but from the world. Verse 17. Verse 17, the world and its desire pass away, but the man who does the will of God live forever. Okay. And so these people that are mentioned in Revelation are earth dwellers. 
uh, people that are mentioned there in the book of Revelation, it, that phrase occurs several times, them that dwell upon the earth, okay? We are not to be earth dwellers. We are, we are to be heavenly minded. Our, our, we are to uh, set our affections on things above and not on things here on the earth. Okay, and so the, the, the phrase, them that dwell upon the earth, is used consistently throughout the book of Revelation in reference to unsaved, unredeemed humanity. Because of God's long suffering, unredeemed ma mankind, God concludes that God will not judge or that God does not know what they are doing look at psalm 73 someone read psalm 73 uh, verses 9 through 11 these people they will believe the lie of satan that sin will not be brought to account they will believe the lie that uh, there will not be any eternal destruction they will believe Satan's lie. Someone read Psalm 73, verses 9 through 11. Psalm 73, verses 9 to 11. And their mouth lay climb to heaven, and their tongues take possessions of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They says, how can God know does the most high have knowledge? Yeah. So they say, they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? These are the earth dwellers. These are the unbelievers. These are unregenerate people. And during the tribulation period, God's displeasure with sin will be experienced in judgment. And even though God's judgment is being poured out, they will not repent. But they will be angry and they will blaspheme God for his judgment. Someone read Revelation 11 and verse 18 and someone else verse chapter 16 and verse 9. Revelation 11 and verse 18. Eleven. And the nations. Okay, you have it. Go ahead, read. Revelation 11, 18. The nation will anger and your word has come. The time has come for touching the dead. And for rewarding your servant, the prophet, and your son, and those who uh, reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Okay, and then Revelation 16 and verse 9. We're just pointing out that this time of, of uh, the upcoming tribulation period is a time of God's judgment for those earth dwellers. It is also a time for reward for God's servants. While, while the judgment on the earth, God's putting out, pouring out his judgment here on the earth, there's going to be rewards taking mm -hmm. place in heaven. Mm -hmm. The judgment seat of Christ is going to be taking place in heaven during the seven year and the marriage supper of the lamb during this seven year period of tribulation and so we get so revelation eleven eighteen is where we get that basis okay all right so revelation 16 verse 9 And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed 
the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. In spite of all of the judgment, of all of the persecution, of all of the tribulation, the people that are living on the earth in that period of time during this tribulation period, they refuse to repent and they refuse to give God glory. Let us not be those types of people. This hour of testing is going to come upon all the world and will be the outpouring of almighty God's wrath on unbelief. God is holy and he hates sin and with every ounce of his being. So I hope that no one uh, in our class is an earth dweller. I hope we don't have any earth dwellers in our uh, discipleship uh, school. Number three, this period is described as a time of distress. Look at Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. Someone read Jeremiah 30 and verse 7, and someone else read Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Jeremiah 30 and verse 7. Jeremiah 30 verse 7. How wonderful that there will be none will be like it. It will be time of trouble for Jacob, but he will be saved out of it. Okay, so in, in King James, it says, alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. See, this is the seven-year period known as the tribulation. Another name, we've seen that it's called the hour of temptation in Revelation 3.10. In Jeremiah 30 and verse 7, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, Daniel 12 and verse 1. Someone read Daniel 12 and verse 1. Let me read, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And of course, he's referring here uh, to the book that's mentioned in Revelation chapter six and seven. And also, I believe uh, this description of the tribulation has particular application to the nation of Israel. This period of great trouble, which will come upon Israel, refers to the second half of the tribulation. The church will have been raptured and God will turn his favor back toward the nation of Israel and it will begin with the unleashing of judgment for her continued rebellion and unbelief. Okay, number four. This period is described in the Bible as indignation and wrath. Let's look up four, four scripture references. Isaiah 26, 20. Isaiah 26, 20. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers. Now, who's he talking here? He's talking to the Jews, the Israelites. Enter into thy chambers. Shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as if it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. Okay? Now someone read Daniel 8 and verse 19. Daniel 8, 19. 
Someone else look up 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10. And someone else look up Revelation chapter 6, verses 16 to 17, and get ready to read these verses. Who has Daniel 8, verse 19? Daniel 8, 19. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. Okay, so God has all this planned. All of this, God already knows the end to the beginning. As we looked at uh, the, that, that uh, Isaiah, uh, we looked at, what was that uh, reference I gave to you? I put it up on the screen. Don't have it in front of me right now. Um, Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. Okay, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. All right. Who has 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10? Someone read it. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. Go ahead, brother. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.10 And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who is deliver us from the wrath to come. Okay, so he has delivered us. And according to 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 9, we have not been appointed to wrath. And we understand that this, this seven-year period of tribulation is a time of wrath, time of God's wrath, time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, it's a time of, uh, of that's going to try the whole world in that time. So we, have, we will be delivered from this wrath to come. This is why we are pre-tribulationalists. This is why we believe in, we are called pre-tribulationists. We believe that God has not appointed us to wrath and that we will not go through this time of tribulation. We are not mid-tribulationists, okay? We are pre-tribulationists, all right? Someone read Revelation 6, 16 through 17. This is the attitude of the people living during the tribulation. What do they say? Revelation 6, 16 to 17. Revelation 6, 16 to 17. And sage to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that seated on the thrones and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And so these people clearly know what's going on. These people living on the earth at that time, during this tribulation period, they clearly understand what is happening. This period is described as a time of indignation, it is a period in which God will pour out his anger against sin. The unbelieving multitudes, unbelieving Israel, and the pseudo kingdom of Antichrist. It is the great day of God's wrath and no unredeemed person will be able to stand. Thank God we have been promised that we will be delivered from this day of God's wrath according to the scriptures that, uh, that I have showed you. That's why we are called pre-tribulationists, okay? Pre-millennialists and pre-tribulationists. That's what, that's what I believe. That's what I believe. That's what I am. Uh, you know, there are people that are mid-tribulationalists. Some people believe that uh, they're going to go through 
half of the tribulation before the rapture. I don't. I believe the rapture is going to occur before the tribulation. Thank you. Okay, someone look at Matthew 10 and verse 28. Matthew 10, 28. Someone read that, please. Who Matthew has it? 10. Yep. Matthew 10, Matthew 10 to the end. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And that, what's that saying? We should fear God. We don't fear man, we fear God. Someone read Hebrews 10, verses 30 through 31. Hebrews 10, 30 through 31. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 30 and 31. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. These are uh, this passage right here in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 26 uh, through uh, verse 31. It's an interesting passage. And I, I believe that this is clearly talking about believers, okay, uh, that vengeance belongs to God. And he says, I will recompense, saith the Lord, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. In context, in context, this is talking about believers who have committed a sin that is worthy of death ananias and sapphira you all remember ananias and sapphira that they had committed a sin that was worthy of death and because and as a result of god judging them and as a result of their premature death great fear came upon the entire church in Jerusalem. And uh, I, I believe that's what this reference here is talking about. Okay, so the period we've noticed now, uh, it follows the rapture of the church, this time of tribulation. First Thessalonians 1 verse 10, we already looked at that. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 9, we looked at that. God's not appointed us to wrath. We looked at Revelation 3 and verse 10. That we are, pro we are promised to be kept from the hour of temptation. God says, because you have kept the word of my patience, I will also keep you from the hour of temptation. And that's, uh, that's the, that's the uh, notice also, according to Matthew 24, 29 through 31 that it precedes the millennial kingdom we looked at these verses we've already looked at these verses does someone want to read matthew 24 29 to 31 hmm? anyone want to read those verses matthew 24 verses 29 through 31 Yes, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give a light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heavens with power and great glory and he shall send his angels with a great sounds of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elects from the four winds from one end of heavens to the other 
Okay, so what what is occurring here? What is occurring in this uh, at this in these verses? What are we what are we witnessing now? We're actually witnessing what we believe. Okay, the end of the tribulation. Okay, uh, Revelation. Let's look. Let's go back to Revelation nineteen. Let's turn back to Revelation nineteen, verse eleven. Revelation 9, verse 11, and I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of god and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen white and clean and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on the, his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So what we're witnessing in these verses is the end of the tribulation, this final great battle, this conflict, battle called Armageddon, okay? Uh, look at Matthew chapter 13. Someone read Matthew 13, verses 29 through 30. This is taking place during the tribulation now. What we just saw was the end of the tribulation. Those verses in, Matt, in Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16, that's going to be that final conflict. But prior to that, Matthew 13, verses 29 through 30. <clears throat> 29, but he said, nay. Now we're talking about nay. the purpose of the tribulation. What is the purpose of tribulation? Go ahead, read. 29. But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tires, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tires and bind them in the bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my bands. Okay, so into my barn. Okay, Revelation 14, verses 14 through 15. Revelation 14, verses 14 and 15. <clears throat> Revelation 14 and 15. And I look, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one set light unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Trust in thy sickle and reef, for the time is come for thee to reef, for the harvest of the earth is rife. Okay, verse 18. Verse 18. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the surf sickle, saying, Trust in thy surf sickle, and gather the clusters of the vines of the earth. For her grapes are fully ripe. 
Today, the tares or the professing believers and the wheat, the true believers, grow together throughout the earth and even in the church. You know the difference between a professor and a possessor? We have many professors. We have many people that profess to be believers. Those would be the tares. The wheat are the true, the true possessors, those, those who, who are truly born again. There is coming a day when the harvest will be ready and God's judgment will be executed and God will gather all the tares, all the unbelievers together and they will be cast into the eternal fire of hell and the wheat, the believers, will be gathered into eternal joy of God's unending kingdom. Now let's read it, Revelation 12. Actually, Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, through chapter 14 and verse 20, is what is known as the third interlude in the book of the Revelation. The third interlude. It comes between John's revelation concerning the seventh trumpet judgment and the seven bowl judgments, the judgment of God upon those who worship the Antichrist is described in this text as being without mixture, Revelation 14 and verse 10. Let me read that for you. Revelation 14, 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured, poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. This is talking about the doom of the beast, the, uh, the beast, the Antichrist, and his, his certain doom where God is going to judge him and eternally punish, execute him eternal punishment. The Lord himself is pictured as seated upon the clouds with a sharp sickle in his hand. The other angels entreat the Lord to act for the harvest of the earth is ripe. The harvest referred to in Revelation 14, 18 through 20 is the destruction of the armies of unbelief in the battle of Armageddon. Those harvested will be cast into the great wine press of the wrath of God and the blood will flow as high as the horse bridle across the entire 200 va mile valley, which is the uh, Valley of Megiddo. And these armies that are, are gathered there are going to be uh, judged. It almost, uh, the description that we read in, in other passages in Zechariah, uh, in Isaiah, it would appear that it's almost nuclear. And of course, uh, when we read what we read there, okay, in Revelation 19, okay, where it says that the armies which were in heaven followed him, okay, in verse 15, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations, okay, and I believe that uh, what this is, is literally nuclear. Jesus himself, I mean, he's the one that created the atom, okay? Uh, and he's going to do some splitting of the atom in that valley of Megiddo. And he's just going to speak. And with his, with his words, I mean, literally the flesh, that's uh, all these, these armies that are gathered there during this battle, uh, the kings of the east. We're talking about a 200 million, according to 
portions of Revelation, uh, the kings of the East, China, probably India, that have crossed over the Euphrates River because God dried up the river to allow these armies to come across. And as they enter into the land of Israel for this final assault, okay, where, where the Antichrist, and that's why, you know, I'll tell you, Putin is ruthless. He's ruthless. He could be a definite candidate, okay? Whether he is, I don't know. But uh, what he's doing in Ukraine right now, it's unbelievable. And I don't personally think he's going to stop. He's probably going to keep pushing, okay? And uh, the incorrigible nature of unsaved men is clearly seen throughout the tribulation period. Men are not good and they are not getting better. Apart from the grace of God, men are slaves to sin and destitute of all righteousness. Even in the face of unrelenting wrath of God against sin, men will not repent and they will not turn from their wicked works. They will continue to worship their false gods of their own making. They will continue in their murders, their sorceries, their fornications, and their thefts. And they will love sin and blaspheme God for his just judgment of their sin. Look at it, Revelation 9. Someone read Revelation 9, verses 20 through 21. Revelation 9, 20 and 21. And someone else look up Revelation 11, 18. We're talking about the tribulation and what's going to take place during this tribulation. This hour that cry the whole earth, this hour of temptation, this time of Jacob's trouble. Revelation 9, 20 and 21. 20 and 21. And the rest of the men who were not killed by this plex, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor work, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornications, nor of their thieves. I think those of you that live in India, you can appreciate these words, but isn't it, isn't it sad that with all this, all these plagues being poured out, God's wrath being meted out, they still will not repent of their idolatry. And that, and, uh, how men's hearts can be so hard. Someone read Revelation 11, verse 18. The nation where anger and your wrath has come, the time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servant, the prophet, and your sin and those who revenge your name, for small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Okay, so we already talked about that verse. So this is where we get our, our doctrinal conviction, okay? That while down here on the earth, this judgment, the seven year period of tribulation is taking place where God is pouring out his wrath upon the earth. In heaven, there is a marriage supper taking place. And what we know in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verses 9 and 10, it talks about the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, where in heaven, the church, okay, we're having the marriage supper of the lamb, and at the same time, the Bema seat, the rewards are being handed out to the church, to the 
church, the believers that have died during the church age, okay? This is uh, one of the references that we use to base that belief upon. Someone read Revelation 16, verses 9 through 11. Anyone have it? And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, talking about the Antichrist. And his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. And they repented not of their deeds. The nations of the unredeemed will be angry with God for his judgment. And, but they will refuse to give him the glory due his name. However, the almighty God who created this universe with a spoken word is not subject to his creation. He is sovereign. When his long suffering is finished and the harvest of sin is fully ripened, God will reap. His cause will be vindicated and his son will be glorified. And the unredeemed will receive the just condemnation of their sin. God has manifested his love and made provision for the salvation for all men in sending his son. The scriptures make it clear that God takes no pleasure in the eternal suffering of men for sin. Ezekiel, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Ezekiel 18, 23. Men perish because they reject God's provision. They reject God's son in whom he most delights. God will not be mocked, and he will not share his glory with anyone. God accomplishes all of his pleasure, which includes the destruction of unbelief and vindication of his son in human history. Galatians 6, 7 through 8, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. The second purpose of the tribulation is God's chastening of his people, Israel. Someone read Isaiah 28, verse 15. Isaiah 28, 15. Because you have said we have made a covenant with death, and with Seor we are in agreement, when the word flowing scourge passes through it will not come to us, but we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hidden ourselves. And so during this period, God is going to be chastening his people, Israel, they actually, you know, had made a covenant with death. This seven-year treaty, this covenant that they make with the Antichrist, okay? And God, God tells them, because you have done this, you've made this agreement with hell, I'm going to judge you in this overflowing scourge will pass and you say, oh, it's not going to affect us. And you have made lies your refuge. And under falsehood, you have hid yourself, God says. And of course, uh, it's a time where God is going to be chastening his people. 
Look at Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. Someone read that. Jeremiah 30 verse 7. I think we already read, read these verses. But let's read them again. This is the response now of Israel. And alas, the day is great, so that none is like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Okay, and so eventually God is going to save all of Israel. A nation will be born in a day. Israel, the nation of Israel will be born in one day. And that, that, that's going to be that's going to be the birth when Christ is going to set up his millennial kingdom, his millennial reign here on the earth. The tribulation period will begin with Israel signing a treaty with Antichrist. Antichrist is the one who comes in his own name that Israel receives as the Lord declared in John 5, 43. This treaty is called by Isaiah a covenant with death. During the first half of the tribulation, Israel will be allowed to reinstate the temple sacrifices and experience relative peace under the protection of the revived Roman Empire. However, in the middle of the tribulation, this is radically going to change. The Antichrist will break his treaty and he will set up an image of himself in the temple in Jerusalem and he will demand worldwide worship he will kill the two witnesses that are spoken of in revelation 11 he will kill the two witnesses and he will begin a campaign of intense persecution against israel the last half of the tribulation period is called the time of jacob's trouble and it will be a special time of god's judgmental chast chastening on israel for her centuries of unbelief and especially for her treaty with the Antichrist. God is not finished with Israel. All of the covenant promises will be fulfilled and Israel as a nation will once again be God's people. A cursory review of Israel's history demonstrates how many times God had to bring chastening upon his people to turn their hearts back to him. The persecution during this tribulation period will be greater than anything before in Israel's history. Two thirds of Israel will perish under the chastening hand of the Lord. Zechariah chapter 13 and verse eight. Please read that. Zechariah 13 and verse eight. Two thirds of Israel will perish under the chastening hand of God. Zechariah 13, verse 8. It shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, the two thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one third shall be left in it. So two thirds are going to perish, and one third is going to enter into the millennial kingdom. One third of Israel will be the beginning of this millennial kingdom. First Peter 1 and 17 says, if you call on the father who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. The soft tenor of American evangelical Christianity has stripped the church of her holy fear of sin. Sin is sickness. Sin is alternative lifestyle. Sin is chemical imbalance. Sin is genetic. Sin is something that must be dealt with through some 12-step program, but sin is not to be feared. The evangelical church has become a church 
that has learned to cope with its dependencies and codependencies and has forgotten how to confront sin. But God has said to his people, sanctify yourselves and be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And the third reason, the tribulation, God's grace will be manifested in the salvation of Israel. Romans 11 and verse 26. Please read Romans 11, verse 26. Remember, two thirds of Israel is going to be destroyed. They're going to perish, and only one third. But look at look what it says in Romans eleven twenty six. Go ahead. So read. all Israel will so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion. They will turn away in goodness, godliness from Jacob. Turn away on godliness from Jacob. Okay, someone else read Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. Zechariah 12 verse 10. And I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourn for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Okay, someone read Zechariah 13, verse 1. On the day foundation will be opened to the house of David, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to clean them from sin and impurity. Okay. In that day, there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And of course, this is talking about the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, someone reads Zechariah 13 and verse 9. Thirteen verse nine, and I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as the silver in refine, and will try them as the gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, "It is my people," and they shall say, "The Lord is my God." Amen, amen. This is when they will look on him whom they pierced. Okay. And uh, in, let me, let me uh, read Zechariah. Zechariah. find the uh, verse that I'm looking at. Zechariah chapter um, 13, verse 6. And one shall say unto him, what are they, what are these wounds in thy hands? This is Zechariah. Now remember, Zechariah was written 500 B.C., 500 years before Christ, before Messiah came. Listen yes. to what Zechariah wrote in chapter 13, verse 6. And one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? And then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man that is my fellow saith the Lord of hosts, smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. And so clearly, 
clearly. Uh, now go to, jump down to Zechariah chapter 14, verse 3. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. We read about that in Revelation chapter 19. He fights with the sword of his mouth, okay? Uh, as when he fought in the day of battle, and verse 4, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. Now notice what's going to happen. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a, a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half toward the south. And this is, this is what's going to happen when Christ returns. That Mount of Olives is literally going to cleave in the midst. And it's going to open up a tremendous land of fertility. Uh, the whole topography uh, during, it would appear that during the millennial reign of Christ, the topography of, of Israel is going to be very different. And that land is going to be very fertile. And, and God is going to, going to do some wonderful things during the millennial reign. Uh, someone read Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Well, we already read that. And we already read Daniel 12 and verse 1. Uh, God's chastening hand will accomplish his purposes as he pours out a spirit of supplication and grace upon his people. And they will turn to God through individual repentance and they will be born again as a new nation of regenerated citizens and so all israel shall be saved at the climactic close of this great day of god's wrath the lord will descend on the mount of olives ripping it in half israel will flee from the onslaught of antichrist armies through the rift created the third part of the nation which God will bring through the fires of persecution will look upon the Messiah and recognize that it was he whom they pierced and they shall call on his name and be gloriously saved. And God will once again declare of Israel, my people, and they shall once again cry out, Yahweh is our God. In Zephaniah chapter three and verse nine, for then I will give to the people purified lips that all of them may call on the name of the Lord to serve him shoulder to shoulder. So it's, uh, it's an amazing, gonna be an amazing time uh, what's gonna take place during the tribulation period. The majority of the believers will pay for their faith with their lives during the tribulation. And it appears that the majority of them will be Gentile believers. There will be a great multitude of them from all nations and kindreds and people and tongues who will stand before the throne having come out of the great tribulation. As Christ descends and the nation of Israel responds in saving faith, God will also call out a host of people from the nations whom he will give purified lips. The word peoples in Zephaniah 3.9 is always used to refer to Gentiles. Not only will the remnant of Israel be saved, but, but God will pour out his saving grace on the nations and a great multitude will turn to Christ and be gloriously saved. The sheep nations will come before the Lord and will hear these glorious words. Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And that concludes this week's lesson. I'm sure there's lots of questions. <laughs>
comments, questions. We went way over our time. So the book of Romans, chapter 11, yes. and verse number 26 says, book of Romans, chapter 11, 26 says, and Paul says that, and all Israel shall be saved. All Israel shall be saved. Right. All, all, and, all of those, all of those people, all of the believing, those people, okay, so that who are the people? Are, who, are the, who are the people are going to die? If he says all the people will be saved, so who all are the Jews are going to die that, in the tribulations? All, all those that all those that came through the tribulation, they will be saved. But uh, Jews are going to die, right? You told the Jews are going to also perish. Thousands, thousands. thousands. So if they are if they are saved, then how they are dying then? Well, it says here, let's, okay, this is going to be, he's, he's quoting here, he's quoting, okay, um, Israel, so named from the grandson of Abraham, all right, okay, Israel, so named from the grandson, was chosen for a fourfold mission, to witness to the unity of God in the midst of universal idolatry. This is why God called Abraham out, okay? To illustrate to the nations the blessedness of serving the one true God, okay? Thirdly, to receive and preserve and tra transmit the scriptures, okay? And to produce to his humanity the Messiah. This is why God chose the nation of Israel. Why he chose Abraham as the representative and then made these promises. According to the prophets, Israel regathered from all nations, restored to her own land and converted is yet to have her greatest earthly exaltation and glory. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away on godliness from Jacob. Now, when he means here all Israel, he's talking about those who believe. God's not going to, not. he doesn't force anyone to believe. All those that believe will be saved. There are going to be many, you know, I mean, many, many that don't believe. There are many Jews that, uh, are in unbelief and die in unbelief. Those people will not be saved. This is talking about a future time when, when Messiah comes and they look and they see the wounds in his hands and they look on the one whom they have pierced and they recognize he is the true Messiah. Those people will be, the, are, that's, who will be saved. And that's going to be the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ. I'm not sure if I answered your question. I'm not sure exactly. Maybe I didn't understand your question. Only those who believe and recognize that Jesus is the Messiah are born again. Nothing changes now and nothing changes then and nothing changed to prior generations of people. Anyone that uh, believes Jesus is Messiah and recognizes him and repents of their sin is born again. And it's only the born again people that are going to enter into this uh, millennial kingdom. Jews and Gentiles. The goats are going to be sent into everlasting destruction. And those who believe 
and recognize the Messiah will make up the new, this new millennial kingdom. A thousand years of peace on earth. It's going to be uh, interesting. I don't have all the answers, brother. Trust me. I don't know if I answered your question. No, you understand, sir. I understand. I understand what you're talking about. Yes, I understand that. <clears throat> There's going to be many people that uh, reject. You know, many, even today. Just look at all the people that reject. And it's hard to believe, you know, uh, how people's hearts can be so hard and so blind uh, to truth. It's so sad. Brother Victor, are you still with us? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am here. I had, I had some. Uh, I had some. Did, did uh, I had some things that I was going to share, but my computer is acting up again, and so um, that's pretty much all that I'm going to cover this week. Uh, if there's any questions, um, yes. From the student side. If there is uh, any questions, they are asking, but from my side, I have no question. Okay. Okay. I'm enjoying. Okay. Any, any, anyone, any comments or any questions, please feel free to talk, man. Please turn your mics on and, and speak. Sir, can you explain me about... Uh... A born again Christians and you know those are there are many they are Christians but still they are committing uh, sins are they are doing mystic are they are born again or so can you explain I don't me about believe I believe I believe that's uh, that's the difference between a possessor and a professor um, I, I I made reference to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 26 through 31, okay? Mm. Hebrews 10, 26 through 31. Some, some, some people would use this passage as well as Hebrews 6. There are some people that would use this to say, see, you can lose your salvation. No, you cannot lose your salvation. Uh, once a person is born, you know, you cannot be unborn. You cannot be unborn physically and you cannot be unborn spiritually. But if a person is born physically into a family, uh, a normal father, because they love their children, expects their children to do things that are right and obey. And when they disobey, there are consequences. The same thing in God's family. Once we are born again, we just can't do what we want to do. Uh, we can't live like we want to. Uh, and, and, and say, oh, I'm born again now. I can do what I want. No, if a person has that attitude, they have never been born again because someone who has been born again is going to want to please God. A born again believer is going to want to please God. You know, I, I well remember the day I got saved and what a remarkable change took place in my attitude, in my heart. The things that I, I, didn't care about before, suddenly I was very concerned about pleasing God and living a holy life. And so when these people that you're talking about that are committing sin or living a, a, a licentious lifestyle 
and they say that they're born again, they're deceived. They're deceived. And one second after they're dead, they're going to realize and they're going to wake up in hell. Sad to say, they're going to wake up in hell because they've deceived themselves and they believe the lie. Very sad. And so that's what I believe uh, Hebrews 10, uh, you know, 26, it says, let's, let's look at that. Hebrews 10, 26. For if we, who's, who's he talking to here? Who is uh, the writer of Hebrews talking to? Okay. All right. Uh, go back to chapter one. God, who at sundry times and in divers manner spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Okay. So, the authorship of Hebrews has been controversial. Okay, it would, it, it, the book is uh, anonymous. It doesn't have, we don't know who the writer is specifically. But it seems conclusive that Paul was the writer. It seems that way. It seems as if Paul was the writer of this, this uh, uh, epistle to the Hebrews. And no more, there's no book of scripture that more fully authenticates itself as inspired than the book of Hebrews. Okay. Uh, and so he's talking here. He says, if we, we, we who profess to be believers, okay, uh, you go back into verse uh, 22, let us, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. So this is clearly talking about believers. And he goes on, he says in verse 26, if we, we who profess to be believers, sin willfully, after that we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Verse 27, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Verse 28, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now look at verse 29. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the son of God. This is a believer. This is a believer. A believer who, who trods underfoot the son of God by living a licentious lifestyle, by committing ungodliness. They say that they're professors, but they live lifestyles of wickedness and sin. Of how much sore punishment shall you shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite to the Spirit of Grace? The question mark. If People that broke Moses' law died, okay, under two or three witnesses, they were stoned to death. How much sore punishment do you think someone who makes a profession of faith 
okay, who professes to be a believer in Christ and then lives a wicked, on a licentious lifestyle, and they, and they 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 tr they take the blood of the covenant and treat it as an unholy thing, and they do despite to the spirit of grace. Of how much sore punishment do you think those people are going to be thought worthy? I would not want to be in a professing Christians shoes who claims to be a believer and lives a lifestyle of sinfulness I would not want to be in their shoes when they stand before God and so that's why he goes on and he says verse 30 for you know him that said vengeance belongeth unto me I will recompense saith the Lord and again, the Lord shall judge his people. If someone claims to be a born again believer and they live a life of sin and they are not being judged by God and they can continue in that ungodly lifestyle, they're not born again. It's exactly what, what, what Paul says, what he says in Hebrews 12. He continues this thought, okay, in, in Hebrews 12, and he goes down verse 5, Hebrews 12, 5, and he says, Have you forgot the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son? despise not the chastening of the Lord nor faint when thou art rebuked of the Lord verse 6 for whom the Lord loves he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives verse 7 if you endure chastening God dealeth with you a son the sons for what son is you whom the father now but look at verse 8 but if you be without chastisement, you are bastards. What does that mean? You're illegitimate. You are not a son. You have never been born again. That's the bottom line. We don't lose our salvation. We can lose, we can die prematurely. Someone who is a believer and lives a life of sin, God will judge them. He will shorten their life. He will remove them. That's why we read in, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 11, verses 26 through 32. These people were partaking of the Lord's table unworthily. They weren't taking it seriously. And the Bible says, God says in Hebrew, in, in, in 1 Corinthians 11, 26 through 32, he said, for this cause, many among you are weak and sickly. These are believers. These were Christians. They were weak. They were sickly. And then he said, and many of you are, many of your people are dead. Why? Because they didn't judge the sin in their lives. They wouldn't deal with the sin. And because they wouldn't deal with the sin, God did. And God chastened them so severely. He tried to use sickness to get their attention, but they wouldn't listen. Through the sickness, they wouldn't get right. <clears throat> and so God had to get more severe. And finally, some of them died. Many of them died. Because God chastened them. God's not going to let his children live in lifestyles of sin. And anyone who thinks they're a child of God and can live a lifestyle of sin and get away with it, never have been born again. Never. So, never. so, so born again people can do sin or not? Can born again people Absolutely. Can do sin or That's not? what I'm telling you. That's what I'm telling you. 
born again people do sin. Ephesians, look at look at Ephesians four. Ephesians four. What's it say? Ephesians four. Okay. Verse thirty. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. He's talking to Christians. Believers do grieve the Spirit of God. How do we grieve him? By bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking. By not being forgiving, by not forgiving people that trespass against us. Believers do commit sin. Sure. But what I'm saying is, as believers, if we are a believer, and we live a lifestyle of sin. God is going to judge us. He's going to chasten. He's going to spank. Spank his children. God's not <clears throat> going to let his children get away with sin. So when the born again people do sin, they will go to hell or heaven, sir. A born again person who sins. Will he go to hell born or again. heaven? When the born, born again, again person is going to go to heaven. A brother, why do we get rewards? What are the rewards for? Do, do you have children? Yeah. Uh, Pastor Joyer, that question is, seems to be salvation is by work. But absolutely, salvation is not by work. Salvation right. is by faith. So right. born again, people always sin. But our salvation is based on the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not based on the human righteousness. Now, my question is, yeah. when the born again people do the sin, will they go to heaven or hell? That is my question. Absolutely, absolutely. They will go to heaven. Born again uh, person will sin. Every born again person is. They are. I suppose if a born again person do adultery, will he go to heaven or hell? Uh, absolutely, they will go to heaven. Born again people. Because when, they do, when they do adultery, when they go to heaven. I think so. How they will go to heaven when they do adultery? How they go to heaven? A uh, brother, a <laughs> pastor. So adultery, also do adultery, they go to heaven. You Pastor see, Das. You, you, Pastor you das. <laughs> Man, I have doubt. I have doubt. Just, yeah. you know, people, this, so I, people do adultery and all kind of sins. So uh, they say when they die, they go to heaven. I don't think that when the adultery people will go to heaven. Uh, Pastor um, Das. Should, should, uh, should a born again believer commit mm -hmm. adultery? Sir, according to me, it's like a born, truly born again Christians, they will not commit adultery and they will not try to do wrong. Was David born again? The, was, David, King David, was King David, David born commit again? Sin. David commit the adultery. However, he repented. He actually, uh, David not only committed adultery, he committed murder. Since he's is a born David, again person, David is David is David going to be in heaven? You better believe he's in heaven, and he's gonna he's gonna he, he he's gonna have a big part, uh, you know, in the future kingdom. No, he Jesus confessed. No, he confessed. He confessed, and he repented. Then he went exactly. to heaven. Uh, exactly. That's the reason why. There's a reason why, uh, Pastor. Uh, there's a reason why born again is always confessed, even though he sinned. Those who are not uh, born again, that's what I, that's even what I want to see, he will have peace and he will not mind yeah. any confession. No. Now my point is, when a person dies, he should die in the Lord. When yeah. he's not in the Lord, when he dies, he cannot go to heaven. He must die in Christ. Then only he will go to heaven. When he dies, even he is not in the Lord, he cannot go to heaven. That so, was like uh, bro uh, brother Das, brother Das. Uh, David committed adultery. He committed murder. 
Yeah, he repented, right? He repented. That's why he went to heaven. But 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 what 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 if what if he had not uh, prior to his decease? Uh, our salvation does not depend on our works, Brother Das. No, I'm not talking about. I'm not. I'm not talking about. Depends on no, God's That promise. is not my subject. Salvation by grace or what? That is not my subject. My subject is when a person dies in sin, whether he will go to heaven or not. That is my question. I'm not talking about sal salvation. Not my subject. When a person okay. dies in sin, will he go to heaven or not? That is my question. Let's please, let please let let's let, uh, let's let First Corinthians eleven, First uh, Corinthians eleven, uh, twenty six through thirty one answers your question. Yeah, uh, once saved in Christ Jesus is saved for eternal, and no one can snatch away from the Father hand. John, in John chapter ten verse twenty nine. John chapter 6, verse 37 to 40. Once that safe in the Father's hand, no one can snatch away. No one can take away from the Father's hand. Once safe, the believer is safe for the eternal. And also, yes, Apostle Paul say in Romans chapter 8, verses right. 8, 38 to 39. So no one can take away even Sidon or even Anger, even the death, even deep or high, nothing can be separated away from the hand of the Christ. So the Bible has confirmed that once born again, saved people, no one can take away from the hand of the Christ. Right. So once saved is saved forever. That's what the Bible is confirmed. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, I think I think the answer to your question, uh, Pastor, is in First Corinthians eleven. Yeah. In um, in verse thirty, thirty one, and thirty two. I think that's uh, that's the answer to your question. Yeah. Please. Uh, do you have that? Do you have that, Pastor Dosh? Do you have that passage? First Corinthians chapter eleven. First Corinthians chapter eleven verses. Yeah. Uh, uh, brother, brother uh, Dosh, will you please read beginning in verse thirty? Uh, verse twenty-nine, beginning in verse twenty-nine. Okay, 29, for he who eat and drink in an unworthy manner, eat and drink judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord body. That's the 29. Yep, now verse 30. For these reasons, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. That is the so, thirty. Okay, so then what he's saying here that these are believers, these are believers that died. Yeah. There, there were some that were weak, there were some that were sickly, and there were some that died. It says, and many, and not just a few, many, many died. Okay. Uh, because they didn't deal with the sin in their lives. And, and why did they die? Because they didn't look at verse 31. Why? Why? For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Okay? If we would, if we would deal with the sin in our lives as believers... If we would get rid of the sin in our lives, we would not, we would not, it would not require God's judgment. But verse 32, but when we are judged, okay, it's talking about when God has to judge us, when God has to do the judging, we are chastened of the Lord. And what is the reason that God does that? 
that we should not be condemned with the world. And so it's not possible for a believer to lose their salvation. It's not, it is possible for a believer to die under God's judgment, under God's chastening hand, prematurely die because they would not deal with the sin in their lives. And that's why in, in Hebrews 12, you know, Paul says, you know, when we're chastened, we're chastened of the Lord, okay? Uh, because the Lord loves his children. And he says, if you don't have chastening, then something's wrong. Because who God does love and who God does know, he chastens every son whom he receives. And if you're without chastening, and you say that you're a son, but you don't have chastening, uh, sorry, you're deceived. You're not, you're not a son because, because you're, a ba you're, you're a bastard. You're illegitimate. Because if you are a son, God's going to chasten you. He's not going to let you live in sin. And so, no, there's, it's not possible for us. It is possible to die in sin. It's possible for a believer to die in sin. Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira, I believe we're going to see them in heaven. I believe we're going to see them in heaven, but because the because they did not, you know, they they lied to the Holy Spirit. They lied that they tried to deceive people. They lied to the Holy Spirit, and God takes takes these things very seriously. He chastened them as an object lesson, as a, an example to the rest of the believers. Hey, I want my church holy. I I don't want my I don't want sin in my church. I want my believers to be holy. And if you're going to do these things, you're going to, you're going to suffer. And, and he, and, and they died. He, he struck them dead. Two of them. But I believe that they're in heaven. I believe Ananias and Sapphira, they died in sin. And they lost their reward. According to first Corinthians chapter two and three, they've lost their reward. I don't want to lose my reward. I want to, I want to have a full reward when I go to heaven. I, I want to die in the Lord. I want to die. Uh, I don't want to die in sin. I want to die in the Lord. I want to get all my reward. I don't want to lose my reward. Amen. Excuse me, sir. Let's not confuse. Let's not confuse works with, uh, um, with reward. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Uh, one, more, one more question, uh, but on Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15 says, If you forgive men, when they sin against you, Heavenly Father will forgive. But if you do not forgive men, when they sin against you, Heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. So a believer, if I'm a uh, if I'm believer, and if I don't forgive your sins, then God will not forgive my sins. So if God is not forgive my sins, then there is no way to be saved. So, what is your opinion on these scriptures? If I don't forgive my brother's sins, then God will not forgive my sins. Then there is no way for me to be safe, of being a Christian. I think you're confusing works with grace. Let's not confuse works and grace. There, you know, our salvation is not based on works. What you're saying is that my salvation is dependent on my works. Well, that's wrong. For by grace are you saved, not of yourselves. It's not of works. Okay. You're confusing works and grace. You can't, you can't confuse works and grace. Uh, if you, if any, any of us think, if any of us think, okay, first John chapter one, let's look at it. Open your Bible. First John chapter one, 
Let's look at it. Okay. First chapter, first John chapter one and verse eight. Let's look at it. First John one, eight. What does it say? If we, 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 we who are believers, if we, we who are believers say that we have no sin, what? We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We don't base our salvation on our works. Our salvation is based on what Christ has done for us. And the gift, the free gift of God that he has given to us of salvation. My, my salvation does not, is not dependent on my works. Let's not yes, confuse. Grace and works. My salvation is best. Uh, I believe that not my work, but through the grace of God. But uh, I was confused with that. That uh, if I don't forgive our brothers, then God will not forgive our sins. Well, if I don't, if I don't forgive my brother. How can I expect God to forgive me? If I can't forgive my brother, how can I expect God to forgive me? If I'm holding a grudge or if I'm holding uh, some, something in my heart against someone, how can I expect God to forgive me? He, you know, I mean, obviously he can't because I'm, 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 I'm harboring sin. I'm, har har I'm harboring a sinful attitude towards somebody and I've got to, I've got to be willing to, that's why Jesus told Peter and Peter said, well, how many times do I, for how many times do I forgive my brother? Seven? And Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. <laughs> There's no limit. You just keep forgiving. You keep forgiving. Not easy to do. Not easy to do sometimes. Uh, Christian, yes, the forgiveness of sin is you are uh, not have to confuse. Forgiveness of sin is absolutely based on the death of Christ Jesus. For the death of Christ Jesus is provided forgiveness of sin and justifications of the man. And there is no any more work Work is not base. Work is baseless. So, for what Jesus said that if you forgive the sin of or the something false of your brother, then also forgive your sin is that is somehow work that Jesus spoke to uh, uh, religious leaders, the Jews in the past, but. After Jesus Christ's death, the new covenant has initiated. And so the forgiveness is absolutely based on the death of Christ Jesus. Okay, thank you, sir. Right. Okay, is answer your question? Uh, right. Good questions, good questions, good questions. Right. Master Das, I don't know. I hope I answered your question. Master Das has some uh, program, so he left for this program because the time oh, is the time is uh, more than forty minutes, uh, nearly forty right. minutes past. Because <laughs> our debate and question and hour is very warm and interesting, so we appreciate uh, for all our students and also our. Uh, Professor Dr. Starr for such interesting hour that he brought to us. So we really thank you. 
And any, any more questions from you? We are already late. So if you have any question, we cannot give it back. <laughs> Go ahead, brother. Nothing will be given back. <laughs> Everything has given up. <laughs> okay. So that uh, our sir star uh, for the next class, what topic I think may be the, the today the tribulations uh, the, the topic of the tribulations that he is teaching to us. Next lesson may be the rapture or something like that, or second coming or millionaire kingdom and either other state may be just is going on. So will be more interesting topic are coming the next. And survey is just tell something about briefly for the next program. Yeah, uh, I want to I want to do a review. I, I would like to do a review and yes, I think uh, what we'll do is then we'll talk about the eternal state. Right. And but I would like to review. I'd like to review. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. I saw that everybody, I think, uh, sir, you may need uh, two or three class or one. How many? I'm not sure. I'll, I'll talk to John. Let me talk to John. Let me see. Let me uh, discuss with him for next week, okay? All right, all right. And just uh, next week, by next week, uh, our sir will let you know us that one more or two more or three more class that he will let you know to us. Uh, I want to be sure. I want to be sure that everyone did get a chance to go through uh, the paper that uh, talks about Dr. Uh, uh, Fred Moritz's paper, where he talks about the difference between covenant theology and uh, dispensational theology. I just hope if you had any questions on that, I uh, just want to be sure everyone's clear. You know, I'm a dispensationalist. Uh, you're, you're welcome to, if you, if you believe in covenant theology, that's fine. I think there is a basis, definitely, as God has clearly given covenants. There's no doubt about that. But I think a dispensational theology is much more biblical. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And all right. Now okay. We, God bless all of you. Shall we close our session with a prayer? Yeah, Let please. me pray. Father, we thank you for the time that you have given unto us and for you have used your servant Dr. Star to teach concerning for the last things. Lord fathers, for you give to all of our brothers for the good understanding which we have learned. So Father, you bring to us to our conclusion, Father, we are going to end of this class from here. Father, Lord, until and unless we meet again to the next class, each and every one of us, Father, your protections may be over with us. And also, Father, we pray for our Dr. Star. Father, you may continuously restore to him his strength and his wisdom and his knowledge. And also, Father, you may bless to him all that he needs. And Father, in his family, that you may bless your grace and your peace and also your joy. Father, thank you so much. Now, Father, let your Holy Spirit may be come to her and to depart from her. In Jesus' name, with thanksgiving. Amen. Uh, please be praying for the meeting this afternoon with some of my family members. I'd appreciate your prayers, okay? okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a blessed day, sir. God uh, bless. God bless. Okay, bye bye. Bye, everyone. Okay, sir. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>